So I've actually got an eye beacon attached to my cat. Ruby is alive, Ruby's not going in. Oh, I want to dream for developer happiness. so-called, or as I call it lovingly, Swiss army knife of a model rubyist. Um, basically, everybody thinks this is a Swiss army knife, it's a regular thing. Um, I see prime more like this thing, it's more like a little bit more, more, even more. But the cool thing is, it's not as, as solid as a gigantic brick like this. You can pretty much just um, modularize it and play around with it, extend it, have your fun with it. Um, to actually get started, so I would like to see my speaker. Got it. So, um, in 1960, John McCarthy uh, wrote a nice paper that basically described how you can easily, with a few operators and a function notation, create a programming language. He called the thing Lisp. It's a thing with lots of parentheses. Some people are afraid of it, some people love it. I'm a big fan of it. Also, this paper was for me the birthday uh, of the so called thing, a REPL. So, what is a REPL? A REPL is basically a four step recipe that gives you a lot of power around your thing. Um, <clears throat> it's a read, evil, print loop, and it literally does, it reads the code, it evaluates the code, the result will be printed out for you, and you loop over. Um, in a list notation, this one looks like something like this. Um, you see clearly, you read from right to left more, that's how lists work, and you have a loop, you have a print, you have an evil, and you read it. Um, this is Ruby, actually, and it's functional Ruby, it works. It looks like a list, um, let's turn it more into like something that looks more Ruby. The fun thing is you just switch the parentheses one layer to the right, and you have Ruby one to the left, you look like a list being a Rubyist. Um, this is the most basic REPL that you can actually have out there. It works, um, yeah. Mostly, it doesn't really do any error checking. It runs the code for you, it evaluates for you. If you do something wrong, boom, it just blows up. Um, but it's already a good thing. So there's already existing REPLs out there that help you get your job done every day. There is, for example, <coughs> IRB, which I quote docs here. IRB stands for Interactive Ruby. It's a tool to interactively exe uh, execute Ruby expression from the standard input. Well, it's a REPL. Um, so it's a quite nice thing, because you have a Ru an R Ruby RC file, <coughs> ERC file. This file is pretty handy, because it's just Ruby again. You can just extend it, make your functions in it, add methods, add helpers. Um, do tedious tasks like um, start the coffee machine, things like that. Just, just have a, lot, a easier life. Um, it also comes with a lot of helpful tools. It's an extension suite called RB Tools. It's almost dependency-ish free, um, but it's nice. Um, and of course, we have our main topic, the good old Pride. Pride REPL <coughs> is maintained by John Meyer, Conrad Irving, and uh, Ryan Fritz Gerald. Um, also, there's a talk called uh, REPL Tool Development by uh, Conrad Irving. Um, that covers also the topics but does more hands-on details. We don't really have time now for like live coding. It's also I'm pretty good at making typos. So um, it has a very vibrant community around it. There's always new stuff being pushed in, things made better, more performant, more extensible. It's amazing. Um, it has a very, very good documentation. Really everything around there is documented. You have a very good uh, wiki. If you have a question, it's just most likely it's answered already. If not, implement it yourself. Um, so, and if also if you like Pry, Pry is a lot of work. Nobody actually gets really paid for it. Um, consider donating to it. Thank you. Consider donating to it either in time, code, or click the donation button and swipe them over a few dollars for the help. So, a little recap. A REPL is a read evil print loop. It's a very basic concept. Um, you can build your own version of it, but it already exists. So, why another? But, um, and it comes with a lot of neat features. Let's get into Pry directly. So Pry itself is, as all the things, and this is for me like the thing that I call most valuable code snippet, it allows you to get started right away. Um, you just gem install it globally, you, or you add it to your gem file, I recommend to add it to your development um, group. You do not necessarily always want to have it in your production environment because it's 25,000 lines of code. Um, you button install it, and you hit Pry Enter, and you're in the matrix, basically. Um, it comes very well documented. 
you can see for type help, every command has a help attached to it. It has a lot of uh, parameters around it, and it really is a, a good thing. Also, one of the, my favorite things is you can browse the documentation of any gem, and if you install PyDoc, also the MRI documentation. All of this also works, by the way, with Rubinius. It's just, yeah, it's Rubinius. Um, so what does this do is, this shows a documentation for array sort, which is implemented in MRI and C code. Um, there's a shortcut for it, question mark, uh, array sort, and the result will look like this. It basically shows you from where the definition is, it will show you who the owner is, so what the class or the module around it, the signature, which is kind of handy, <coughs> so how many parameters or what kind of parameters you need, um, the visibility, public, private, protected, it helps a lot, sometimes you do not want to always use send to get around those protections, and you shouldn't. And also some helpful, less things like the number of lines of the code, which I don't really understand why it's in there. But the most important part is in the, you see in the middle, is the actual documentation that allows you to understand what this thing does for you. And it works on a module level, so you can see the documentation for a whole module. It, can, it works on a class level, and it really also gives you all the meta information around it. Another neat thing is show source, which shows you the code of your class, your function, your module. And also here you need to install PryDoc to actually be able to use the or see the C code. Um, it looks like this. So <laughs> array sort is basically just a wrapper around every sort. Um, and also here you see the visibility of the, the function, you see, or the method, pardon. Uh, you see where it's coming from. For Ruby code, that would be Ruby, not C code. I'm sorry for this. Um, and also, again, lots of meta information attached to it. Another neat thing mm. is here is edit. This is pretty cool because this will open the file or the method in your editor. You can modify it. You will save it, close the file, and REPL will reload the code for you, and you have to change this right at your fingertips and can use it right away. This works for install gems. This works for local uh, files. It does not work for C code because the compiling can be fiddly. Um, and it does do to directly fix your code at the point where you are. And it also, of course, works for whole classes, modules, all this stuff. Um, there's another neat thing is CD. And what we're going to do here is basically we create a new array and we change in it. And you can consider basically the object system in Ruby like a file system. You can walk through them, you can look into them, you can change them, you can remove them. It's object objects. Um, if we CD into an object here in the, in the new array that we just created, we see that the prompt changes that we're now inside the array. Um, inside the array, I can ask, where am I? Because sometimes you just get lost. And it will show you here inside an array. Um, if you are in an instance where there's actually the code available, um, it also shows you, for example, we have a breakpoint, which we'll cover later. It shows you where you are and shows you the lines of code around it, mostly it's, um, until the outer lines of your method call. Um, so, once you're in there, you can show the source of it, and the cool thing is, so first, we saw the method sort. When you see now, is something even more interesting. We see here, oh, too small, number of monkey patches, three. So, something, and this is a completely fresh start at REPL, patched the, the array class for us three times. Um, this is especially helpful when you work like with active anything, basically. Um, the number just increases by more active you have in your gem file. It's, uh, it's just it's amazing. Um, and it allows you to actually with a dash A to page through all these monkey patches and to see what is actually of these monkey patches is breaking your code or making your life very, very hard. So another thing is, it's a file system as I called it. You can ls, you can show all your methods that are in there. You can show your variables that are defined within an instantiated object, but also within a, in a class methods. Um, also, those of you included modules, and you can wrap with it through it with a, a regular expression, and we'll just return the ones that you actually have in there. Um, an alternative for this would be the find method. Um, this will recursively walk up your whole <coughs> object tree to find the method that matches the, the pattern that you have. Um, this will look like something like this, and you see, for example, array gets some stuff from a number of methods. It gets some stuff from about itself, from the, its own methods. And the locals, and for example, everything that starts with an underscore is by a convention, a prime internal. Those things is, have very interesting things. For example, you have the underscore, underscore x. This is the latest exception that you had. If there is none, it's obviously nil, uh, hopefully. Um, you also have like underscore, underscore pi, which is pi itself. 
and you can interact with the system there. You should, however, not too much um, fiddle around with those um, because it can bring your REPL into a state of, uh, of doom and despair. Sorry. So, how can these tools actually help you? Well, I mean, recently I ran into a bug. I was uh, fiddling around with a library that was doing an HTTP request, was not using that HTTP, um, and something broke terribly in there and I had no idea what happened. So what I usually do is I go on GitHub, browse through the source, open one tab after another with a reference. This is called here, that is called there, and you open up. And at one point you have so many tabs open that the favicons are gone. And I think who actually ran into this problem here once? Just by navigating, oh my god, they really should change the shit. <laughs> um, so at this point, when I'm completely frustrated, I clone the source code. And then the same thing happens, but in my text editor. I open file after file and walk through it. Then at one point I figure out, hey, I just cloned master, but the version I'm using is like too old, so damn. So what, what probably helps you here is you already have it installed in your app, and you can basically navigate through the code that you have installed to the correct version um, with Pry from the command line. So you do not need to fiddle around, you don't need to get a tab messy or a browser messy. Um, you can just have it, and it most likely helps you to understand the context and everything around you way better. And <clears throat> it helps me, of course, the better my understanding is of code, the less code I write. And my personal um, motto is, less code is better code. So, you can also, let's do some extended pride. We're getting through the theory to get our hands on to some <laughs> concepts a little bit later. Don't fall asleep, please. So, Pry is extendable. It has commands and plugins. What the hell are those? So, commands are not methods. <laughs> commands are pretty much, um, it's a special form of a string that gets evaluated before the actual command gets evaluated. So, you can actually modify this command before you actually execute. This gives you a lot of power, and you can do nice little things. You can capture a command before actually executing it, modifying its state. It all works without monkey patching. The syntax is way more intuitive than actually building a plugin because it requires less code instead of having a file and all these kind of things you have in your prior C. You have three lines instead of three files, less code is more, you're happy. Um, it gets all nicely evaluated for you. Um, you're always in the local context, so <coughs> it's only in your console. Your, your improvements are in your console, which is good because you do not in, it really influence the production system with it or any other system around it. And it also helps you to really form your workflow and get better in what you do. <laughs> stop repeating yourself, stop doing like user.last, do this to the user, save the user. You can automate this. So how does a command look like? This is a command that will literally just run the last command you typed in again when you hit enter. So I type, for example, continue, and I hit enter, and enter, and enter, and enter. I save typing continue. I save doing arrow up enter. It's just one character. It's amazing. Um, you can also do aliases. It's basically, you can consider it a little bit like your regular setter stage or bash shell. You can do aliases when you're too lazy to type five characters, reduce it to one. When you're even lazier, just hit enter again. And as, again, as mentioned, uh, prior internals start with an underscore. They're easy and fun to fiddle around, but also dangerous. So what are plugins? Plugins actually allow you to extend Pry in a shareable way. Um, and this is pretty cool because it gives you interoperability with other libraries and gems. And we will look into a few of those in a bit. And it also helps, again, to form your workflow. This is one of the important parts. I see so many people developing software that have just a very, very painful workflow to observe and follow. Because you see, they spend more time struggling with getting their stuff done than actually getting their stuff done. So, what are those kind of plugins that are out there? This is like four of my favorite ones. It's Bybug, the Exception Explorer, Macros, and Waze. Macros is <coughs> anybody here is using Emacs? Yes, thank you. So, you know, with keyboard macros is basically you record something. Um, so, Bybug is an interface for a debugger. And who of you has never used a debugger? That's a good ratio. So a debug is something that I can actually stop you now. No. Um, <coughs> so a debug is actually something very nice. It allows you to get into the context where you're right now. You, are, you can step through it. You can observe just instead of step the code that is in front of you. You can basically live experience, breathe the code, breathe the objects, be in them. Go through their guts, figure out why it's broken. And you also can introspect the current state. You can modify the runtime and make broken things fixed then you know how to fix them, then you actually change it in your code and it's fixed. Um, you also have the Exception Explorer, which basically 
doesn't you do not need to set that breakpoint anymore once there is an error happening or exception happening. It just drops you right in there in this in the state where the error happens and you also save again time. If you are able to bind this in your workflow, it's really neat and nice. Um, so macros are recordings basically. You record repetitive steps. User dot last, user dot first name is blah, user dot save. Um, this is basically you record a macro, you store it and you recall it again. And if you're really lazy, you bind it to one key and just press enter or escape or something else. And of course you have prior arrays. We're here at arrays conf, so I have to mention this. Um, prior arrays gives you all the power of pride <coughs> within your Rails environment and it shows you your roots. You can grab through them, you can easily walk through them, which is pretty neat. Um, and it also shows you the models, your definitions, your data sets on it, your fields on it, and if, for example, there's an index or not on it. And yeah, so a recap. Pry is a pretty neat tool to navigate code. <coughs> it helps me personally a lot to actually understand what I'm struggling with here, <coughs> which is on a daily basis a lot, actually. Um, you have the documentation always at your fingertips. I do not need to go into my browser anymore, open another tab that I forget about, then I minimize the whole window, start another browser, and to fill that one out again. And it can be extended and uh, customized <coughs> to shape your workflow and make you happy and fill your needs and not just the needs that somebody else thought you should have. And now the actual fun part, mm. REPL-driven development and debugging. So as I mentioned, REPL-driven development, RD, is not thing particularly new. It's basically since the 60s there, um, early days of lists. Um, people really embrace it. So usually before I actually got into like really programming in the bigger scale, the professional level, let's call it like this, um, I had <coughs> lots of those here sprinkled over my code. Puts the current user object, inspect it, what is, what is in this thing? The problem with that is you only get a little glimpse or is this true? Will I be called even? Where is this coming from? Is this predicate even returning it true? Um, all this stuff, oh, the conditions, they're so terrible. You probably want to use something better here, like duct typing. Or, this is one of my favorite, I use this all the time, and the more deeper I get down in my call stack, the more question marks I add, the more <laughs> exclamation marks I add, until at one point I have like a whole screen full with what the fuck is like, hmm, where? <laughs> I mean, your naming is hard, and naming a debug output is even harder, because it's, well, you need to get somewhere. So, I ended up having this sprinkle all over my code, and the biggest problem about it is, <coughs> at one point, you actually need to clean this up again. So you need to grab through all the code, you need to find all the puts, the P's. P is a very, is a very, very often used letter in the English alphabet. So you find a lot of those. Um, then you forget one, you commit it, it runs in production, all of a sudden you have like, what the fuck in your, in your production logs? You're like, hmm, I think I forgot something here. <laughs> and yeah, mostly when you do not expect it. What I already mentioned once is context is something that's really, really good to help you understand where you are, what your problem is, and how to actually fix it. So if you use something like puts and just, you only have like a moment, you have a snapshot of this one thing that you're looking at. Once this is printed, it's over, it's gone, the state changed. State is a really tricky thing. Um, you need to rerun your code, you need to get deeper, you need to figure out what is the method that is actually changing my state, where is my context, save it, rerun it, save it, rerun it, oh, it's five, I'll see you later. Um, so this is how work days can very easily be passed with a lot of frustration and very little effectiveness. Um, what, really, what you want to do is you want to understand the context. You want to see the state. You want to know what it is. My biggest problem is, or one of them, I have a lot of big problems when it comes to state. For example, I struggle very hard with it. And if you have problems with state, you should do me one favor, read Out of the Tar Pit by Ben Mosley and Peter Marks, and hopefully you will stop mutating state. And then you need to have less puts, less debugging. Um, so, avoid state, and just keep the context. So this is a fictional graph that I made up. Um, green is basically the number of puts in my code, yellow is my understanding of the code, and red is the use of a debugger. Um, red also goes with my level of happiness. The better I understand stuff, the less puts I need, the more efficient I am, the only I can go home and do other fun stuff. So what is a debugger? This is a nice thing from the Oxford Dictionary, a, pro a computer program that assists the detection and correction of errors in other computer programs. It's just a tool that it can use that helps you. So my first contact with a debugger, I think, was like Boron C++ 2. Point anything, um, nice little thing, running on DOS, had like F8 to go next, F6 to step deeper. 
um, later some Java stuff, which was a little scary because there was all Freddy <coughs> stuff. It was all just mostly <coughs> doing things around me. But somehow of the time I forgot when I, when I got into, into the craziness of Ruby, I forgot about the debugger. And I see still lots and lots of people actually writing Ruby code in all different platforms, no, do not use a debugger. <coughs> and maybe we should make an organization that is like spreading the word of debuggers under there. It's a free tool, please use it. So, as mentioned, Pry has a great uh, integration for Bybug, which is a uh, Ruby 2.0 uh, compatible, and Ruby 1.9 is not supported anymore, mm -hmm. debugger for you. And you can set breakpoints within your code. The execution stops there, you can inspect the current state again, you know the context. You can either walk deeper into your call stack, or you can inspect the code here, figure out what is actually wrong, why it's wrong, run some commands in there, print out maybe some values that you would do anyways. You don't really lose anything. Um, you can also, one of the fun things is, if you walk through massive amounts of data, suddenly you have like a uh, no method uh, plus for nil class. It's like, cool, where are my 10,000 data sets? This is not happening. Um, what I usually do then is I use a conditional breakpoint, which is, which is if this condition happens, drop me to the context, I want to know how this happened, where it's coming from, and how I can fix it. And it's also nice to navigate code. You can, on the one hand, step through your code sequence step by step, you can go deeper, but you can also, for example, walk up and down the caller stack. This allows you pretty much to figure out on a very high level and then narrow it down and down and down and down and down and down, which is especially helpful when you consider using active something again, especially when it's called record. Um, there is too much magic happening. Callbacks, anybody? Don't use them. They are really, they, they hurt you. Um, so it also helps you to figure out who actually initiated your method call. And as I, as I mentioned, active record is basically a big hairy fluff of metaprogramming. And <clears throat> the only way to actually navigate this somehow sanely, in my opinion, is um, with a proper debugger. So also a good thing is um, in, in, inclusive, uh, uh, implicit change of, of state and variables. As I mentioned, callbacks have the tendencies of changing something somewhere. And you walk through your code and some, at one point a value just disappears. You don't really know why. Well, you can observe and, and basically watch the values while you step through your code and see when exactly it happens and then navigate deeper down there. So this is basically how a debugger looks like. I guess it's not really a big new thing for you. But you can really nicely see, I just stopped here I can print out the name and up basically allows me to go one level up to see where it's actually called. And in this case, use it at full name. Um, so, pretty much optimize your workflow. Use plugins like the Exception Explorer, which drop you right in there. It helps you, for example, to do TDD like a gaming thing. Pretty much, you run the test, it fails, you drop right with your debugger in there, you figure out why it's broken, you fix the test, you run again, and it does all this for you with a way, way better and way, way quicker feedback cycle. Um, debug is an essential tool for me, and especially for every developer, and a short and direct feedback cycle is that what makes me happy at least. So repository development is, like as I mentioned, TDD, BDD, give it another acronym, are great tools, although officially they're dead, like Ruby's dead. Um, <laughs> or, huh? So, those are fantastic tools that ensure that we arrive and our destination it being having something implemented that works in a very nice manner because we can document, we actually did something, look at this amazing amounts of code that I've written to get there. Quite often what my problem is, I first of all need to get started with it to understand what I'm doing there. I need to figure out how this library works. I cannot TDD my way into the library to understand it works because I will write so much code that it will just throw away again. <coughs> I want to understand how this works, how I can plug in the bigger parts. So I start writing some code in the REPL, mark some calls, to an API, see what the result is, decide, do I use an open stroke, do I use something else, do I get out of my, out of my comfort zone and use an active something for it. Um, and it's really, it's not a new concept. Lists use it since ages. Functional and uh, programming languages like Erlang and Haskell, they basically embrace you to do it, especially Erlang. People pretty much write Erlang code, they see it works in a REPL, they copy and paste it to a file and ship it to production. They don't even write a test for it most of the time. If it doesn't break, they just log into this machine and fix it there. That's maybe a little bit too much, but it's, it's, it's what people, young people call YOLO, basically. <laughs> or Yoko, you only deploy once in a way, um, and then you just rappled your way through it. So it allows me very much to just, and I'm keeping repeating myself like a broken record here, but explore the domain, figure out your state, get your hands dirty on it. If you have a piece of code that works for you, 
copy it, paste it, slap a test on it, make it clean, move on. This really is a, a good, very quick, very direct feedback cycle. And, sorry. So, there's even one community that literally celebrates battles. It's Clojure. Anybody knows Clojure here? More. You need to learn about it. It's cool because they actually can do music live. So beforehand you've seen uh, Julia almost de decapitating the first throw with his drones. Imagine you have a rebel where you can do that and actually control it. Um, but what they do is they create music with code. They evaluate the code in the rebel, send it to the VM, it does something with it, it makes bleep bloop, it makes nice beats, there's amazing talks about this stuff, and it's really fun to use. And this also fits in the computers are way more than just working tools, they're also tools for creativity. And once you massage both sides of your brain, you're actually being way more relaxed again. You can get out of there and get better and stuff. Or make visual artists, people use it for that. So, understanding the problem is, as I said, the hardest part in actually getting started. Before you write your first real test, that actually should stick around for a while, and when it's right, you don't delete it, you fix it. Um, keeping the connections in your head is very hard when you just look at the code, you jump through files. You want to get this all together in one context. The direct feedback loop around it is very, very good, at least for me. Um, and because I have a very short attention span, it's like 15 and a half seconds, max, then I'm lost. Hi. Um, so at any time of your whole development process, being from the beginning to the end, to the actual shipment, a rebel should always be your friend. It's like a little dog on a leash that you have with you that's like guiding you through your youth and through your puberty and then you forget about it because it's buried in the backyard. But one day you come back to it, it's like, I miss you. <laughs> and you really keep it. It's there. It's quickly started. It just helps you. When you write the test, when you write the code, when you repeat it, it's just there for you. It also helps a lot in exploring and teaching. So I help occasionally when I have time for it, and I try to get more into that, help new people come into the Ruby world, into the programming world, and teach them. And a long-term Rubyist is like, oh, I just use this and that and that, and I'm done, it's, it's green, it's cool, it's, it works. But it doesn't really help people. They need to get their hands dirty, they need to type the code, they need to get the feedback. Nothing is as hard as a, as a, a record that screams in your, in your face, I cannot do this for you. But you know, at the same time, it's a validated feedback. You have a direct result. And it's also fun for pair programming. If you're a pair programmer, sometimes you just don't want to write the whole method in a, in a file and discuss for ages. You just want to exchange Everybody is writing the implementation and then discussing it directly. You have direct feedback. You don't need to build up a whole system around it. It's super nice for this. So to recap, and then I'm almost done here. Debugging is essential and can avoid a lot, a lot of frustration. It helps you to give a better understanding of your feedback cycle, uh, of your state and of your current context. State is really bad. Um, it gives you a quicker feedback cycle. Helps to a better understanding. Better understanding is less code. Less code is better works in my opinion and it's powerful for beginners and advanced programmers and especially to connect those two to get even more programmers out there because we all know we need more developers out there who help us developing more great code that is actually less code does more so the future I would like to see remote controlled robots for a rebel and seriously Julian Aww. oh I want to see that um, pride driven robots I, you can do it in IRB <laughs> Good one. Um, or let rappers for life system like Erlang people do. Um, maybe just read only mode, um, but at least that you have an understanding. Having an exception tracker somewhere is nice, but the exception is usually old. And what was the current thing happening there is long gone by the G GC, comes by, swipes it away under the rug. Um, also, for example, having interactive uh, rappel for Sonic Pi. Sonic Pi is a music tool that allows people to teach actually programming to kids with tones and music. At the same time, it's a lot of fun for adults too. It's really it's fun to annoy your neighbors. Um, and where you restart in queues, workers um, push your, your, your queue that you have uh, built in a standard library, stuff like this. And especially, every library out of there that has code in it should have a REPL. It makes it so easy for people to come in your project to help you contribute because it's easier to set up to get into the system you can set it up for them. Also, watch the talk by, by Conrad Irving, it's really good. He actually types stuff and uh, shows you way more in depth how the stuff works. Go to priorepple.com, uh, or um, it's very nice there. Thank you very much.
um, Andy, um, Pixelpunk on Twitter and GitHub. Um, if you have any questions, tweet me or grab me later for a beer or in a hall or somewhere like this. I work for Contentful.com, we are CMS as a backend. Um, and they allowed me to come here and share my thoughts with you. And here, take a <coughs> with you. Thank you.